Namo Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale, Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta, Swami Tinamene, Namo Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale, Mate Vedanta Vamiti Nava Harmonium Haste Sarasati Deve Godavani Prachadi Nevasatiavadi Asta Chasa Tarehine Sarasati Jaya Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Kirada Sri Vakana Kodavakta Vena Sri Krishna Chaitanya
Krishna. Acharya, Ashtotaya Sada Shri Sri, Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada Ki, Ananta Kota Vaishna Vrinda Ki, Namacharya Shlahari Dasta Kaur Ki, Prem Segaho Sri Krishna Chaitanya, Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gauradhar, Sri Vasari Gora Bhakta Vrinda Ki, Sri Sri Radha Krishna Gopa Gopina, Shama Kunda Radha Kunda Giri Govardhan Ki, Sri Vrindavan Dham Ki, Sri Mayapur Dham Ki, Ganga Maya Ki, Yamuna Maya Ki, Tulasi Deva Ki, Bhakti Deva Ki, Samaveta Bhakta Vrinda Ki, Lord Chaitanya's Haridam Sankirtan Ki, Brihat Madanga Ki, Shri Prabhupada Ki, Shri Shri Jagannath Baladev Sabadra Ki, Shri Shri Gornitai Ki. All glorious to the assembled devotees. All glorious to Shri Guru and Garanga. All glorious to Shri Prabhupada. Namo Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Vastaya Vitale. Shri Mati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Ki Namani. Namaste Sarasati Devi. Gauravani Pracharine Nevasesha Samyavadi Paschachade Shatarine. Hare Krishna, everybody, dear devotees. At the moment, I am in Lisbon, in Portugal. This is our, we could say more or less, our first time out of France since the lockdown began almost two years ago. And we're, we went from France through Spain visiting a few centers in Spain, very uh, beautiful, impressive farm community, which we visited and another Grihasta community in Spain. And we'll be going back to Spain. We're driving four of us doing Sankatana as we go. And uh, today we're in Lisbon in the little temple we have, devotees have here in, in Portugal. And in, in front of us are very beautiful, very large deities of Lord Jagannath, Baladev, and Sabadra, and beautiful little marble deities of Gornitai. And so maybe some of you have been to Lisbon, I don't know, but it's a very, very happy city, a very beautiful city, and very nice for Thank you, Tan. Many nice devotees are here. A beautiful restaurant here, also run by some devotees in the city. So today we're going to um, we welcome you all. And uh, we're going to continue our reading from Srimad Bhagavatam. 
and we're going to request um, our dear Rasikananda Prabhu, if he can please. Uh, there we go. Okay. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, we are reading from text number I don't know if we did eight last time, but I don't think so. Did we do eight last time? Text number eight is Dharma Srinivasa Prabhu Sambhishwak Singh Dasya. I don't know if we did. I can't remember. It was a few weeks ago. Um, well, we'll do number eight and nine today, if that's okay. If Asikananda Prabhu can share the screen for text eight and nine of the Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto one, chapter two, Divinity and Divine Service. And as we've mentioned before, this particular chapter is extremely important. Sri Prabhupada placed very much emphasis on this chapter as basically you could say it sums up the entirety of the uh, Krishna conscious process of devotional service in one chapter. And the rest of the Srimad Bhagavatam, of course, developed this. If this is in response to the sages and inquiries of Sutta Goswami, um, where he, um, they were making many inquiries. So in this chapter, um, Sutta Goswami is explaining very clearly um, the means, the method for God realization and what the real essential purpose of the human form of life is. So we'll start with text number eight. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So I'll read one line um, through. Dharma Svanushti Thakpung Sam Dharma Svanusti Tag Pung Sam Vishvak Sena Katasuya Vishvak Sena Katasuya Not Pada Yet Yadi Rating 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 Shrama Eva Hikavalam Shrama Eva Hikavalam Shrama Eva Hikavalam And we'll do the synonyms if we can come get there. I'll just read them through because you can see them. Dharmaha occupation, Svanushtitaha, executed in terms of one's own position. Pung Sam of humankind. Vishvaksena, the personality of Godhead, plenary portion. Katasu, in the message of. Yaha, what is. No, not. Utpadayat, does produce. Yadi, if. Ratim, attraction. Shramaha, useless labor. Eva, only. He, certainly. Kevalam, entirely. In the translation of Purport by Sri Prabhupada. Um, are devotees in Portugal also? Connected some on Facebook through the camera here. So we also like to welcome some of our devotees from our local community here in Portugal who um, are perhaps joining us through Facebook. Unfortunately, circumstantially, we're not translating it directly into Portuguese. Maybe somebody, I don't know, 
how that works. Um, could do it, but uh, we apologize if you cannot follow the English, but we hope you can. Translation and prayer quote by Sri Prabhupada. The occupational activities a man performs according to his own position are only so much useless labor if they do not provoke attraction to the message of the personality of Godhead. This is one, as we mentioned earlier, one of the many famous verses in this chapter of Srimad Bhagavatam. And we go on to the purport. There are different occupational activities in terms of man's different conceptions of life. To the gross materialist, who cannot see anything beyond the gross material body, there is nothing beyond the senses. Basically speaking, this is the situation of the vast majority of people in the world today. Their whole life is based around sensual perception and trying to satisfy their mind. There are six senses, um, including the mind, we have six senses, especially the mind, which is constantly, constantly, there are desires flowing into the mind. They never stop coming in. And life is more or less focused around trying to um, deal with the various desires or thoughts that come into our minds by utilizing this body with its various senses in trying to um, achieve or um, satisfy the various desires or dis attachments within the mind. This is most people's lives are focused on this. Um, and very little energy, if any at all, is uh, channeled towards a spiritual pursuit. In most cases, none. Absolutely zero. Just like the animal, they have no, there is no, there is simply no presence of a spiritual quest in their consciousness normally. And human beings, it's almost the same. There is nothing beyond the senses. Even if they theorize in practical dealings, practically speaking, they're living their lives, their activities are based upon this principle. Because the goal of life is to try to satisfy one's senses. Therefore, and Prabhupada continues, therefore his occupational activities are limited to concentrated and extended selfishness. Even if one is engaged in so-called welfare work within the realms of this material world, it still comes under the classification of selfishness because it's based on this bodily principle or this principle that we are this body. The goal of life is to achieve a satisfaction of one's senses, material senses. So this is considered, in one sense, it's not really of selfishness, but it's uh, uh, in, in, in terms of the real self, but it's selfishness in, in the sense of uh, only considering um, our own um, pleasure or our extended family or our country, whatever it may be, but it's based upon a false, um, a false understanding, a false premise that we are this body. And all the activities are, are centered around that principle. So this is, uh, although it may be called welfare work, it may be called very generous, it is a uh, Prabhupada describes it sometimes as um, um, amongst thieves. What do they call it? Honor. Uh, honor amongst that's thieves. one. Honor amongst thieves or honesty. Honesty amongst thieves. Huh? Thieves are stealing. Everyone's stealing. Um, and when, so for instance, you may be a, the leader of a band of thieves. So you send your band out to go on their version of, of uh, Sankirtan, and they go out to collect money, and uh, when they steal money, and when they come back, we all sit down together. Now we have to be honest here, we have to be fair, and we have to share this honestly amongst ourselves, this honesty amongst thieves. But whether you do it this way or that way, the fact of the matter is everyone is a thief. And in this material world, this is the actual 
situation unknown to pretty much anybody. We, we somehow know that have this assumption of uh, claiming rights as soon as we're born into a certain situation. We assume it's, you know, it's ours or it's for our whatever to be utilized amongst us. Um, but this is an assumption which we, we uh, you know, because we don't understand anything beyond it. It's like a ch children who have no idea of the proprietor of anything, come to speak of it practically, will see things as an object for their own pleasure, not knowing it belongs to somebody else up to a certain age. So we're like that. We don't want to accept that there's an actual proprietor of um, um, Sava Loka Mahesh from somebody who is actually the proprietor of everything around us. It belongs to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, everything. And as we, some of you may have read the Isha Upanishad, the famous verse in the Isha Upanishad, isn't it? What is that verse? Isha Vasya Midam Sarvam Yat Kincha Jagat Jam Jagat Tena Chak Tena Bunjita Magadikasha Svidanam. And the meaning of this verse, everything animate, and inanimate. And I guess everyone knows what that means, everything moving and unmoving, basically, in terms of how we see it, um, is the pro property of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. It's owned by him, not by us. We're given a quota, just like, you know, we may be given some quota by the government of some kind, some land or some property or something. Um, but it doesn't belong to us. It's just you know, for our ut utilization. <coughs> um, so uh, the living entity is given a quota by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That quota, of course, is according to our karma and desire. But we have a quota in the form of this material body with its various capacities, mental, subtle, and gross. Um, and karmically speaking, whatever comes in according to our, our life's journey in the course of our journey in terms of property or persons etc etc wealth and what have you but we have our quota um, and we see some people work very very hard and they don't have much and some people don't seem to work very hard at all and they have a lot Doesn't it? some people just life of ease and they're billionaires and I was working day and night, two, three, four jobs, and they can barely maintain their family. They have different quotas. Um, what, what does Zenda say? One should accept one's quota. What's the second part of that verse? Look at that. Understanding. Understanding to whom everything belongs. One should not try to usurp others' quotas. The tendency is, because of ignorance, that people in this world have this tendency to try to, because of envy and greed and so on, some people are greedy and then others become envious, and on it goes, and uh, competition comes in, and no one's satisfied, because ultimately nothing belongs to us. So the selfishness is to see things separately from the Supreme Lord. The whole Vedic structure is based upon this gradual transformation of how we see things, not what we see. It's not a question of having or not having, it's a question of how we see it. Um, and as long as we see it separately from the Lord, it's, we're actually in this category of being selfish, ignorant um, of our true identity or the true proprietor. This me and mine is the fundamental uh, misconception of human society that who i am i and who does this belong to and practically speaking there's no education beyond the uh, limited understanding of the, seeing it in relationship to ourselves practically none um, but the real knowledge is to see everything in relationship with the supreme person even the Brahma Jyoti in relationship to the Supreme Person and not separate from him. Everything, the planets of this universe, our lives, our everything, our family, whatever it may be, everything in relationship to us. So the Vedic society 
is devised. Maybe in the beginning, it's more or less an imposition. Here we have the word, um, uh, what is that? Nustitasya. Dharmasya. That's the verse we're reading, isn't it? Nusitasya, Dharmasya. Yeah, no. Dharmas for Nusitas. So Nusitas Pungsam. That's the previous verse. Dharmas for Nusitas Pungsam. That's just for Nusitas. Svanustita is the stita means steady and sva. We have svadharma or occupational activity. So in the material world, one's occupational activity, the one can be steady, is according to one's uh, according to the modes of nature, according to our karmic reaction, according to a particular nature which we have acquired. Everyone has a different nature. Kali Yuga is uh, it's much more difficult complicated environment, complicated situation which confuses people as to what they should or should not do. Most people are quite, un, are not sure what they should be doing. They're changing and, uh, you know, mostly it's based upon financial considerations. It's not necessarily based upon our own, you know, inner satisfaction in terms of the work which we do, but more the fruits of our work has become a more you know, prominent deciding factor. And in this way, there is great greed, dissatisfaction, envy, confusion, anger, frustration, and so on, become more and more prominent, both individually and collectively. And because people are not rightly situated. And even if one is rightly situated, that doesn't uh, mean, therefore, that our life will be successful. We may be a more of a peaceful society, maybe, um, but without spiritual knowledge, without spiritual guidance in life, it is in this verse, which we've just read, is from A.V. Kavon, is a waste of time. So it gets nowhere. It's just uh, going round and round in circles according to the karma that we acquire. That's all. We're caught in the, in the karma. And this karma bundle, this knot of reactionary work, has to be cut. Yoda Nijas Nayukta Karma Gwantana Bandana. This verse will come up soon. Chindanti Kogadas Tasya Kona Kudit Katara Tim. You have to cut that knot with uh, a process. Ultimate process is remembering Krishna. But there is a gradual process to come to that platform of cutting this knot of illusion. The illusion is not the material world, but it's seeing it in relationship to ourselves. This is the illusion. And therefore, oh, we, we make all of our decisions based on, on that principle practically. We likes and dislikes, all the decisions we make are based upon that principle of seeing everything in relationship to what we think is ourself. Vedic scriptures, Srimad Bhagavatam, of course, exclusively, uh, they aimed at this point to see things in relationship with Krishna, to make this transformation of perception. So a Vedic system is to gradually utilize, it starts by a society which is based upon one's nature, the Varna Ashram system, and then utilizing the fruits of our work in the service of the Lord, knowingly or unknowingly, at least a percentage. This is the Sankirtan movement, and you could say in a different way in terms of its structure or its format. But in the same principle, I was thinking last night, one man said, Hare Krishna, money. He was, he related, he was laughing. He's a nice guy, but he thought, you know, Hare Krishna, you guys, you just want money. Well, <laughs> it's kind of ironic in a sense that uh, most people are hankering for money in its present form, we have this artificial monetary system. Um, but the, the, the purpose of Sankirtan, the purpose of the Varnashram system is to connect that with Krishna. Otherwise, that money is the cause of one's suffering. It's the cause of distress. <laughs> and the devotee is releasing, whether we know it or not, releasing that person from a cause of distress. And not only that, but engaging that money in Krishna's service, that person gets eternal benefit. He's being connected with Krishna. Lakshmi, after all, belongs to Krishna. Lakshmi Narayan is there. Um, can't have Narayan. People want to have Lakshmi without Narayan. 
And you really can't have Narayan without Lakshmi, so they're inseparable. Maybe Lakshmi doesn't always appear in the present form that we can that we identify with. Lakshmi is the consort of the Lord, the pleasure potency of the Lord. Um, and uh, nowadays it's manifested by money and what we can achieve through money. But ultimately, that must be engaged in a service of Krishna. <clears throat> it belongs to Krishna, not to us. So liberating people from this misconception is the means of this Sankirtan movement and connecting them with Krishna. Both me and mine, these two false conceptions are eradicated, corrected through the Sankirtan movement. And the Vedic system of Varnashram and all these others have the same ultimate goal. They may be just a little bit more, we could say, slow in many cases, um, but they have the same goal not very practical in Kali Yuga in its full sense of the term because things are so complicated and uh, we have all these unending varieties of occupations nowadays you don't even know what they mean people you ask somebody what they're doing and you cannot ascertain what is it that they're doing from what they say half the time you know right I'm an engineer but Actually, they're, they're working with computers, doing some mm. computer engineering work. And then all kinds of technical terms, medical world, and, uh, computer world, and so many different things. And changing sometimes three or four different degrees. People go from, some people are like a lifetime um, student. You know, they study one thing, then they get fed up with that and study another and study another. <laughs> They don't know what to do, and they're still not satisfied. Um, but this stita means steady, and one can only be really steady when, materially speaking, spiritually, when we're connected with Krishna, and materially, when we're connected in the sense with our, as the dharma, our natural nature, our nature. Some people find it, um, and they, they're completely at home in their work, but their work may not be particularly favorable, um, and they may not also be offering anything or connecting any of that to Krishna. So it's also from a waste of time. We'll read on a little bit. Concentrated selfishness. Um, well, there's nothing wrong. Therefore, his occupational activities are limited to concentrated and extended selfishness. Concentrated selfishness centers around the personal body. This is generally seen amongst the lower animals. We mentioned that. Extended selfishness is manifested in human society and centers around family, society, community, nation, and world with a view to gross bodily comfort. This is the idea we want. Increasing the bodily comforts of life. <laughs> anyone is... If you look at it from time over a scan of uh, a period of time, even that you can see is not necessarily being achieved. There's so many discomforts and we can't avoid it because karma comes whether we, whether it comes in a nice car or in a bicycle or with a horse or whether it comes from, you know, watching some uh, movie or or just going to a local fair, or whatever it may be, the same principles there, once allotment of happiness and distress comes accordingly. It may look more fancy or more glossy, it may cost more money, and other people may be, you know, looking up, for, and you're proud, or whatever it may be, you have something very special now. Um, but it doesn't mean that one's happiness and distress are any different than if you don't have. They're not depending upon the, the accumulation of wealth, so to speak, or the, the um, um, achievement of some position in society. Above these gross materialists are the mental speculators who <laughs> hover, hover aloft in the mental spheres, <laughs> dreaming and speculating, and theorizing, and their occupational duties involve, and here's what they may be contributing something here, poetry and philosophy, 
or propagating some ism with the same aim of selfishness limited to the body and the mind based upon the same foundational principle <coughs> of uh, selfishness, trying to satisfy our senses, be it goodness, passion, or ignorance, which is dominating our nature, but uh, still the same principle is there. But above the body and mind is the dormant, use it as dormant spirit soul, whose absence from the body makes the whole range of bodily and mental selfishness completely null and void. It means nothing like a dream. These material endeavors are just like a dream, trying to always make a nice dream, but it doesn't always come. <laughs> And the living entity, even in the material sense of the term, is not, you know, when we wake up, we realize, oh, that's a dream. It is described later in the Bhagavatam as an art of Ashamam Shakshad Bhakti Yoga Hoksha Jain. Uh, these, all these material um, tanglements that we have are all superfluous. They have nothing directly to do with the soul. But unfortunately, people do not know this, although they can. This can be the, the <clears throat> miseries of the living entity, uh, which are a result of our fault, our ignorance, um, are superfluous to the soul. They can be mitigated immediately by the linking process of devotional service. But unfortunately, people do not know this. Therefore, Srila Vyasadeva has compiled this Srimad Bhagavatam, which is in relationship with the Supreme Personality of God. <clears throat> This is the mitigation when we connect with the Supreme, very simple, we connect with the Supreme Personality of Godhead, all the problems are solved, both individually, collectively, etc. Also, when we're connected to Krishna. And like a fish out of water, so many endeavors are made to try to sustain and satisfy the fish out of water. But unless the fish is replaced back into the water, <clears throat> the fish will never be satisfied. So like that in this material world, the living entity is like a fish out of the water. And we're trying in so many ways to uh, satisfy our natural spiritual need. Um, but because of basically ignorance, the living entities fail. Maybe for a little while you get some relief, but we fail in an ultimate goal of life to satisfy the self, as we heard, as we're hearing in these various verses, um, uh, how the soul uh, is fully satisfied. And it's not possible. In the previous verse, Vaipung Sang Parodama Yato Bhaktir Dhokshi Jay Hoitiki Apatirta. In atma suprasidity, in atma suprasidity means fully satisfying the self. When our activities are dedicated to the personality <coughs> of Godhead, it's not when they're dedicated to society or mankind or family or nation or religion or whatever, maybe to religion can be beneficial if it's properly guided. But if it's not properly guided, it can also be another blockage or another obstacle on one's actual connection with Godhead. In other words, if it's uh, controlled, if we're, instead of following the religion, we're utilizing religion for our selfish purposes, either mental or physical. Um, religion is meant to go the codes of God to control or regulate our behavior, our uh, thoughts, etc. But Prabhupada goes on. Um, but less intelligent people have no information of the needs of the spirit soul. No information. As Prabhupada many times point out, where is your department of soul research? Very rarely we find such a, maybe there are some institutes specifically for that reason, but very rare you will not find in university degree 
soul research, not there. Because foolish people have no information of the soul and how it is beyond the purview of the body and mind, they are not satisfied in the performance of their occupational duties. Never be satisfied, no matter how much you do. You're never satisfied. It's like the body, for instance, probably give a simple example. We have to feed the stomach. You may have nice food, but if we don't put it in the stomach, if we put it in the ear or in the feet, we will not be satisfied. Or a tree, the example of watering the tree is a very famous example. If you don't water the root, the tree will not be satisfied. Or the fish out of water, no matter what we give the fish, it will not be satisfied because it's not a natural position. This material world is an unnatural situation for the soul. Sometimes people say, well, you know, Hare Krishna, this is all very well. But what about in your real life? You know, in your normal life? But this is not normal life. This is not real life, living in this body, struggling with all the various mm, uger karmic activities, unwanted or unpleasant activities that we are absorbed in. What is how sitting in front of a television for hours on end, just watching a screen, being more or less controlled by what's going on on the screen is hardly the business of a human being. Spending 12 hours a day with a mobile stuck to one's ear, sending text messages in front of a computer all day long, anxiety, this thing, that thing, messages, messages. <clears throat> working in a factory, pressing buttons, pulling levers. Is this really the business of a year? Is this the best we can do in a human form of life? No, not according to the Shastras. Human life is meant, jivasitap, um, jivasitap the human life is meant for inquiry into the nature of the absolute truth. That is the purpose, Omatata Brahmadignas. It's meant for inquiry into the nature of the absolute. It is not meant for sense gratification. Srimad Bhagavatam. In other places in the scriptures, we will see some licenses there, regulated sense gratification. Even in religion, when we were, at least I don't know now, but when we were young, every Friday, you know, I'm a family, we're not religious at all, but it was a tradition, Christian tradition. Every Friday, you do not eat meat. You can eat fish, but not meat. Every Friday. And in, sometimes there are still places and still communities that fast on certain occasions from certain things to regulate, restrict um, the uh, engagement in an unwanted activity, activity which is detrimental physically, in a sense also, but especially on the spiritual path. So regulation is there. Religious regulate gives regulation to one's behavior, sinful activity or otherwise. So we can gradually, gradually, the tendency to serve our senses becomes <clears throat> regulated and then controlled and then engaged in Krishna's service. So it's not just about becoming free of the control of the senses, it's about engaging those senses in the service of Krishna. Utilizing them to satisfy Krishna or to serve water, the root of the tree, then the whole tree will be nourished. If we're actually connected to Krishna, all the problems can be solved in life. Of course, birth, death, disease, and a old age will still be there, but one can bring that cycle to an end forevermore when we learn this process and practically apply this process of connecting everything to Krishna. Without knowing the need of the dormant soul, one cannot be happy simply. Did I miss a line out there? Yes, probably. The question of the satisfaction of the self is raised herein. The self is beyond the gross body and subtle mind. He is the potent active principle of the body and mind. He is not a creation of modern science. Uh, comes up with as a creation of a you know a material energy at a certain point of time 
consciousness develops and it's almost like consciousness itself is the end of uh, life basically there's no being that's conscious it's just a consciousness manifests sometimes within this particular form of body different consciousness manifests differently in different bodies uh, without any real understanding of a entity beyond consciousness beyond physical experience uh, but that consciousness just like the sun rays are coming from the sun that consciousness is coming from the soul awareness presence of what existence within this material framework is coming from the soul not from matter matter is unconscious generally understood that matter is unconscious. There is even consciousness there, but it's dormant, it's not manifested. Prabhupada used the word here, dormant, in terms of the soul, but the soul is dormant in a sense of its awareness of its existence, um, but it's there. Without the presence of the soul, there is no consciousness. There will be no awareness, even if the awareness is that of a dream. If there's no, if when we're dead, at least in that particular body, there's no dream, it's over. Um, one may move on to another one. But the consciousness or awareness is because of the presence of the soul. Being aware of the environment which we're in and how the environment affects our sense, through our senses, affects the mind. And uh, then the intelligence is very busy trying to rationalize, work out what to do with all of this, try to adjust things in our favor. Um, but intelligence should be used differently. Intelligence should be used. How to utilize this in Krishna's service? And then, no more problem. Krishna will take care of everything. It's all his energy. And there's no more need to fear anything. Without knowing the need of the dormant soul, one cannot be happy simply with emolument of the body and mind. The body and mind are but superfluous outer coverings of the spirit soul. The spirit soul's needs must be fulfilled simply by cleansing the cage of the bird. One does not satisfy the bird. One must actually know the needs of the bird himself. This is another famous little analogy uh, given um, to illustrate our futile, futile endeavors in this world. There was one time and I'll just cut the story short. The old lady, she had a bird in the cage. There's different variations of how that came to be. But anyway, eventually the bird is in the cage and she doesn't, she's more attached to the cage than she is to the bird. She buys this bird in the cage, but she's more attached to the cage and she's busy decorating the cage, painting the cage, cleaning the cage and advertising and showing off her amazing cage that she has. And she completely ignores the bird within the cage. One day when a friend or somebody comes and uh, what's that smell? I don't know. And they look and they find that the smell is due to the bird and the cage has died. Oh, wow, how is this? I don't know. I was decorating the cage, cleaning the cage, painting the cage, and so on so nicely. I don't know what happened. I said, but you have fed the bird. You never fed the bird. You didn't give any water or food. People don't know how to feed the soul. We don't know how to really satisfy ourselves. It eludes us simply by connecting with Krishna as a finger or a part of the body is satisfied when connected to the body, when the soul is connected to Krishna, then we can be satisfied. Back home, returned after a long journey in this world, so I can be satisfied. We all know this. We're so busy. Oh, how much energy is incredible. It's spent medical energy, scientific research, and so on and so forth, trying to solve this, this simple problem. But we're so complicated, and we still don't achieve success. 
still a lot of the problem is not just imagine now with all of our science and all of the medical and so-called advancement all the big brains one tiny imperceptible practically speaking tiny little virus is is bewildering everybody it's defeating them all it's so small and according to them it doesn't have any any brain or any intellect anyway it is so tiny whether you, whether you can even see it i don't know so-called coronavirus co whatever it is and they paint they show pictures of it with all these things sticking out of it they all got different things where it's incredibly complex, according to their statement. But they don't know what to do about it. They just, uh, you just let it be. That's it. That's life. Life goes on. You can't stop it. You think it'd be just, you know, just like that. That's the end of that one. All that so called advance. And what are the use of all this advance? We can't even deal with one teeny weeny, so small virus which completely puts the whole world into fear and millions of people are, you know, lives are, billions of people's lives are just turned upside down. It doesn't show a very high level of intellect. But anyway, all of our energy is spent like this on this pursuit of trying to, you know, avoid inevitable suffering and try to increase ordained happiness can't avoid it it's not very intelligent to do this is deadly down you are bound to die that's another at the end of the tunnel despite all of our incredible advancements so-called in various fields of knowledge it doesn't matter who we are the result is exactly the same we die what is the result of science we all die what is the result of medicine? We all die. What is the result of education? We all die. Sense gratification? We all die. It's the same result. Big, small, old, young, rich, poor, educated, uneducated. The same ultimate result is there. Karmas will vary. And usually the more educated you are, the more advanced you are, the more karma you get. Because we misuse it. When you have a penny, you don't have much to spend. You're not going to get to. When you have millions of euros, dollars, or whatever it is, and we use it for material reasons, a tremendous amount of karma. We read on. The need of the spirit soul is he wants to get out of the limited sphere of material bondage and fulfill his desire for complete freedom. That's the need. Complete freedom. We want freedom, but we don't know what complete freedom is. He wants to get out of the covered walls of the greater universe. He wants to see the free light and the spirit. Sometimes we talk, people talk a little bit like this. But there is a process to achieve it. But that they may or may not want to follow. The complete freedom is achieved when he meets the complete spirit, the personality of Godhead. There is a dormant affection for God within everyone. Spiritual existence is manifested through the gross body and the mind in the form of perverted affection for gross and subtle matter. So that need or that desire is there within all of us. We all want freedom. We all want this uh, affection. And some of whether it's for God, it's perverted in this world towards family members, to dogs, towards society, and so on. Because it's the soul's need. We all need loving affection. We all need happiness and peace and freedom. To be encaged in this body is not very nice. You know, we get used to it. It's like being locked up in a prison cell. It may not sound very nice, but you'll get used to it after a while as your normal state of being. And when you get an extra piece of bread, it's a big achievement. Or you get a softer cushion to lie on. Fantastic. You feel great. But we're in a prison that we don't, we've forgotten that this body is a prison cell. 
what we do with it is another thing, but it is a prison cell. We're stuck in it. This world is a big prison, and we're a cell inside of the big prison. And the idea, the, the solution is to get out of the prison, not to stay in the prison and try to make it a nice place, which is what most people do, and religion mostly is aimed at that, trying to make the prison a nice place. It's not meant for that. That's how it's developed. So to get out of this prison isn't just about giving up the life in this body. That doesn't solve it at all. It's to for the soul to no longer act and think in a way as to create future material bodies. Karma is defined as activity which causes the development of future material bodies. So the process is to engage in what's called akarma, not karma or vikarma. Most people, Prabhupada uses the term karmi, but actually in reality it's vikarmi. To be called a karmi is a great compliment. To be called a shudra is a great compliment because people are not karmis even, they're vikarmis. They're not following any proper religious principles. Karmis are those who are at least following some kind of religious guidance in their lives, regulating, moderating, but most people are vikarmi. Just do what you like as much as you can get away with it. That's a vikarmi, sinful, sinful behavior. Karma is that activity which will gradually bring us, if we follow properly, to a more elevated state. And our karma is that activity which will release us all together from this material world. So we have to try, at least as aspiring devotees, as much as we can to engage in our karma. Activities directly engaged in relationship with Krishna. Maybe in the beginning it's mixed with karma, mishra, bhakti, with yad karoshya dashnasi, yad yaho, siddhasi, yad, etc., where we utilize the fruits of our work in the service of Krishna. That will gradually bring us to this point of freedom. Um, and ultimately, it's when we're working for the pleasure of Krishna. Whatever we do is for Krishna's pleasure, not for our own. That's the, of course, the objective goal of action for a devotee. But the process of devotional service is that process leading to that state of consciousness. By engaging our senses, Rishikena, Rishikesha Bhakti Seva Uchite, in the service of the Lord. This is the process of devotional service. When we learn to engage everything in Krishna's service, we'll read on some long purport. Um, this is where I mean, therefore, we have to engage ourselves in occupational engagements that will evoke our divine consciousness. Mm. Describes, therefore, with one pointed attention, one should therefore constantly hear about, chant, hear about, remember, and worship the personality of Godhead as a friend of all the devotees. So, this process of always keeping engaged in various forms of devotional service. This is possible only. This is possible only by hearing and chanting the divine activities of the Supreme Lord and any occupational activity which does not help one to achieve attachment. For hearing and chanting the transcendental message of Godhead is said herein to be simply a waste of time. Interesting. That uh, goes along with that statement which we sometimes hear of Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj describing what is sadhana where he says, sadhana is that activity which helps us to develop a taste for hearing and chanting. And if our activity doesn't help us to develop a taste for hearing and chanting, it is an obstacle on the path of devotion, even though we call it sadhana. This is the process to um, awaken this taste for hearing and chanting about Krishna. Otherwise, it's, what is the point of it? What is the purpose? Prabhupada said, anything's okay if it helps us to develop our love of God, genuinely speaking whatever it may be. But if it doesn't, what's the use of it? Same thing with austerity. There's a famous verse. I can't remember it, but I remember the essence of it. Uh, it goes, 
what's the point of austerities if it doesn't help us to awaken our love for Krishna? And if we've awoken our love for Krishna, what's the point of austerities? That can be applied to every single subject practice. The goal of life is to awaken our love of God. We should remember that. This is because other occupational duties, whatever ism they may belong to, cannot give liberation to the soul. Even the activities of the salvationists are considered to be useless because of their failure to pick up the fountainhead of all liberties. The gross materialist can practically see that his material gain is limited only to time and space, either in this world or in the other. Even if he goes up to the Svargaloka, he will find no permanent, there's no stita there, there's no permanent situation, no permanent abode for his hankering soul. The hankering soul must be satisfied by the perfect scientific process of perfect devotional service. So this is the um, amazing purport by Sri Prabhupada summarizing the whole that's a fallacy of material advancement and the solution to all problems given therein. You don't just point out the fallacies, the solution has to be given also. The solution of the linking process to the personality of Godhead through the means of devotional service. Okay, so I'm going to finish there for today. Are there any questions or comments? You can send them in the chat if you wish. It all sounds very simple, doesn't it? But how entangled we are and the pressures around us from environment, from our conditioning, from all the accumulated uh, tendencies and desires which we've, which we've uh, received from our previous sojourns in this world. So many desires constantly flow into, as in the Bhagavad Gita is a, a beautiful verse one time. When Prabhupada was talking to Sabag Maharaj, Prabhupada was saying how this verse was the most important verse in, in, in the whole Bhagavad Gita. I can't remember. How does it go now? Um, it's in the second chapter. Have you got Bhagavad Gita here? Can you bring, bring the Gita? Quick, please. In the second chapter. It was a beautiful verse. Right at the end of the second chapter. You can, yeah, okay. So second chapter is the contents of the Gita summarized. And text number, here it is, text number 70. Hapoyamanam vachalapatishtam samudra mapapa vishanti yadvat tadvat kamayang pravishanti sarde sashanti mapnotina kamakami. A person who is not disturbed by the incessant flow of desires that enter like rivers into the ocean, which is ever being filled, but is always still, can alone achieve peace, are not the man who strives to satisfy such desires. We never achieve peace as long as we try to work to try to satisfy our desires. Sounds strange from an ignorant point of view, but one who can, uh, is undisturbed by the flow knowing that they're nothing to do with us. They're superfluous, they're external. Just like when you watch a TV, your mind is like a, you know, very complex television, we could say in a sense. When you watch it, you become many times affected emotionally by what you see. But if you realize what it is, we don't need to be affected. It's, it, even materially speaking, it's really nothing to do with us. You know, if there's some horror movie or some love scene or some war scene or some violence or whatever on the screen, it really doesn't have anything to do with us, right? Just something, it may not even be, it may be completely fictitious, but we get affected by it because we identify with it. We identify. So as long as we identify with all these desires that come into our minds, we'll be affected so many ways but when we have identification with Krishna our identification with what we see on the mental plane is no longer the same 
We just see it as Krishna's energy. Amazing energy of the Lord belongs to Krishna. And this material energy all belongs to Krishna. Junior Athanavas, Kamanova, Kamana, Buddha Evacha. Earth, water, fire, air, and ether, mind, intelligence, false ego, these are all Krishna's energies. <coughs> Even apart from that. It's a very nice verse. So we'll now we'll take some questions on chat or comments. There's a statement above the body and mind is a dormant spirit soul. Why is the spirit soul considered dormant? I briefly mentioned it, thank you, Gaurav. I briefly mentioned it in the talk, um, briefly, how the soul is there, but he's, it's like when you're sleeping at night, the soul is there, but we're practically speaking not aware of our, what we call our normal um, life. During the daytime, we think that we're whatever it is that we are. And when we sleep at night, we're not aware. We're, the soul is there, but he's in a, like a dormant witness stage, simply witnessing. So in this material world, the soul is basically witnessing um, the show of the material energy. And depending how we relate to that show, we get a, the end, we then get another show. We have another body or another situation we find ourselves. But in one sense, the soul is, is inactive. In another sense, it's active because we're, we have, we're affected by what environment we're in and we start developing various desires and uh, relationships with what we see around us or what we experience grows more subtle. But in reality, the soul is not acting according to its natural constitution or position. So in that sense, it's dormant. The real nature of the soul is not manifested. It's perverted, but it's in this perverted reflective energy. It's in the dream state. We're not fully awake the dormant nature of the soul the character the eternal characteristics of the soul are only minutely manifested and in a perverted form in this present situation but our real conscious awareness of our relationship with krishna is in a dormant state it has to be awoken krishna consciousness human society is meant to fully awaken um, the living entity to our eternal consciousness or krishna consciousness and when we're only materially conscious, that is not the constitution of the soul. Hmm. What are uh, what is what advice can you give to maintain Krishna consciousness for a whole life? If the in, in the temple, it may be easier, but once in the outside world, it can be more difficult. How to progress in a way to not put too much oppression on ourselves in the beginning of our path, but more to progress and find the balance of what we can offer. I know examples of many people who were very serious, but after some years, something happened and they leave the Krishna consciousness. Okay, this is very, we would say, practical um, concern and a common thing. And Prabhupada even said, don't be surprised about those who leave, be surprised about those who stay. Now, don't get fearful about that. Um, it, there's no loss, as Krishna says, Mayhapi There is never a loss on the path of devotional service. And even if for some time one may go back to sleep again, one will wake up again. Um, having come to this uh, threshold, threshold of Krishna consciousness. And sometimes, many times, in the beginning stages, uh, of an aspired may desist in their practice and go back to whatever they go back to or into whatever they do is very common but whatever asset or whatever um one is imbibed from one's process of association devotion service is never lost so that's one thing secondly um krishna of course is guiding every single living entity and what we have to go through um whether it's within the temple outside the temple away from Krishna consciousness, whatever it is, Prabhupada says, when someone first comes to Krishna conscious connection, Krishna personally then takes a hand. And whatever happens there on in is gradual or quick arrangement, depending on what, what we have our desires to. But it is, can, Krishna then takes his hand 
to gradually bring us to the point of realizing we don't belong in this material world. Sometimes we have to go through those experiences uh, more to realize that this is not our real home. We're still not being, sometimes God will say, not being kicked enough yet. <laughs> Or we just some misconception is there. We're still carrying too many material conceptions of Krishna consciousness with us. And uh, at a certain point in time, Krishna may, you know, not if we don't realize that and accept it, this is repentance, we could say, then we sometimes have to learn the hard way again to return to a sense. We don't have to go through that process. So the question is how to avoid having to go through that again, you know, as if you're a drug addict, how do you have to go through it again and again and again? How is that possible? Well, of course, the association of devotees is not just about hanging around devotees. It's about taking advantage of the real purpose of association with devotees, favorably, favorable association by uh, together, helping each other, hearing and chanting together, to, to help each other to, to to go deeper and deeper into practically speaking hearing and chanting and devotional service of the Lord um, trying to realize um, how valuable that association is and avoiding the association if we read in the nectar of instruction we can see therein that which is favorable for devotional service that was unfavorable for devotional service so you read in the nectar of instruction verses two and three of the nectar of instruction and four in terms of how to enhance our devotional relationships read them carefully they're very 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 important Prabhupada said this nectar of instruction is meant for neophytes on the path of devotional service like ourselves so read those verses very carefully how we can develop that confidence how we can develop that patience that enthusiasm uh, etc. on the path of devotional service. Very important to read Nectar of Instruction, those verses. And therein you'll find the answer, how we can avoid this uh, risk, because we're surrounded by distraction, we're surrounded by obstacles, whatever you wish to call it. How to keep our focus on the goal. The secret is to keep one's focus on the goal. And I remember one time I was in the metro in the underground in London, and there was a big billboard in the metro in the underground in the station there. And it said, obstacles are, th are things you see when you lose sight of the goal. We always get caught by the obstacles, very well, not always, but we easily get caught. So when we have our focus on the goal, how can you get caught by the obstacles around it? It was a picture of the sun rising. And it was an arch on it. The sun was rising on oh, the sun never really rises, but it looked like it rose on the horizon of the ocean. And the, it was rising in the middle of this arch, and all around were jagged rocks. It said obstacles are things you see when you lose sight of the goal. There's the famous story in the history of the Pandavas and the Kauravas when they were studying under Dronacharya. He was teaching them. Uh, the art of archery, of shooting arrows. So he put a false bird in a tree at a far distant place. And he called his students up one by one by one. And he said, you know, the goal was to shoot the arrow in the eye of the bird. And he said, what do you see? He didn't ask them to shoot. One by one, he said, what do you see? He said, one of them said, I see the eye of the bird. See anything else? Yes, I see the bird. I see the tree, one by one. And eventually he called up Arjuna. And he said, what do you see? I see the eye of the bird. What else do you see? The eye of the bird. What else do you see? The eye of the bird, nothing else. His focus was on the goal. Of course, as you say in your question, you have to live in this world around us. How to relate everything in this world to Krishna? That requires hearing. It requires association. We can also, of course, use prayer. Good sadhana. In the morning, if you can, before going to work, before going to school, whatever we're doing, before as much as we can. We can't always do it. You have kids. It doesn't always work like that. But as much as we can, 
good sadhana. Don't minimize the importance of this. We may be very enthusiastic, but without good sadhana, we can easily get disturbed. We have to be focused as, on our objective goal. Every, how to see everything in relationship with Krishna. Good sadhana. Let's move on to another one. Um, sometimes we go through austerities, like waking up early in the morning after a late night or doing our seva even when we may be slightly sick. We tend to focus more on the bodily discomfort and less on the Lord. In such situations, should we give in to the bodily discomfort and stop the austerity or not surrender to our mind, telling us to easily give up and keep up with the austerity, even if it means that we may be chanting inattentively due to lack of sleep or not focusing on the savor. My goodness. Whew. Sounds very difficult, doesn't it? Whew. It's easy to find so many excuses Therefore, regulation in devotional service, those who are regulated in their eating and sleeping, etc., can practice yoga. Um, so as much as possible, we try to find out what we need. And as much as possible, we try to regulate accordingly what we need to eat, what we need, how much sleep we need, in normal circumstances, as much as possible. It will vary from person to person. There are general guidelines, but the details will vary. And we tend to sometimes imitate. Isha Upanishad warns us to play the part designated to us by the Lord and not imitate others. So sometimes we do, but then for whatever reason, and naturally that's going to happen in the beginning stages until we find our means, our stability, or whatever. That which is favorable, that which is unfavorable. In the beginning, there's bound to be this situation. Somebody is preaching to us. If you sleep more than six hours a night, you're an animal. And all sorts of funny things you hear. You know, that's it. Ah, you know, Prabhupada said we should reduce sleeping and eating to nil. You know, you should get up for Mangalarti even if you're on your deathbed. We'll drag you down the stairs. You hear all these things. <laughs> I mean, there's time, place, and circumstance for everything, but you know, you know, I mean, we got to lose a little bit of, I'm going to say, common sense. We don't have any. Uh, the least common thing in society is common sense. Uh, we got to use a little bit of common sense there and see what is practical. Health is very important. Prabhupada gave a strong emphasis. Health means keeping the machine fit so that we can render service. What is the goal of life? Is not to go to Mongolia. The goal of life is not to chant 16 rounds. The goal of life is not to do this, that, and the other. These are all to help us to achieve the goal of life, maybe, but if they don't help us to achieve the goal of life, what's the point? We're not really achieving the purpose. So if we're falling asleep left, right, and center, we have to look and see why I'm falling asleep left. Maybe we're sick. Maybe we need more sleep. Maybe we just ate 10 kilos too much rice before we went to bed, or whatever it is. You know? Then we're going to find out the reason for it, if, we, if there is one. Otherwise, just adjust. We have, you know, yes, sometimes the time, place, and circumstance, we can, you know, we are here to perform austerities, but not austerities which create ill health, austerities that create anger, austerities that create, you know, I can't handle this, I'm giving up. That which is appropriate is not a question you can answer with it. Everyone's individual. And for this, is the important thing of having mentorship, having association with devotees in our lives when we can discuss what is favorable, what is unfavorable, what is our balance, etc., is important. We haven't got the intelligence. Arjuna was all over the place when Bhagavad Gita started. He didn't know whether he was coming or going. He didn't know what was right or what was wrong. You know, should I, shouldn't I? This thing, that thing. So he took shot of Krishna's intelligence and Krishna guided him. We need that. But that's an individual thing. If you're a Kshatriya, if you're a Vaishya, Shudra, Brahman, whatever your so-called designated position is, it'll vary from one to the next. What is a sad enough for somebody who's got shudra mentality is not that sad enough for one who's got a brahminical tendency. It's complete. Like you said here, that austerity is like getting up in the morning early. For some people, get up, or getting up late in the morning is an austerity. For some people, eating a lot is an austerity. For some, eating a little is an austerity. It varies from person to person. 
for studying the scriptures for some is an austerity for killing people on the battlefield for some it's not an austerity at all as easy as pie everyone's different but the principle is we should find what is our proper sadhana according to our situation there are general things chant Hare Krishna is for everyone how you chant where you chant when you chant may vary that's the detail but the principle is there worship Krishna hear about Krishna glorify Krishna serve Krishna but the details will vary but that takes a little, either a little time a little help from others a little of mercy from the Lord we can pray for his guidance and experience which one gets we generally don't have the intelligence to ascertain from reading scripture, which is the actual instruction, which is really relevant to us. That's where we need guides, Guru Shastra Sadhana. Guru Shastra doesn't go out of scripture, but Guru and Shastra help us to ascertain which, well, let's say, what direction of the, which is given in the scripture is relevant to us at this particular point in time. Next one. Maybe that is the next one. Whatever we are eating, we are supposed to offer that to the Lord. And then we can accept the prasadam. But when we buy cornflakes, oh, we buy cornflakes, do we? Or bread or some other food item, should we offer those as well? Ooh, I'm sure Krishna likes cornflakes. Very tasty. Um, and again, this is a very interesting subject and a subject which is sometimes answered black and white and sometimes it's answered completely gray. Um, so black and white answer to that is you shouldn't buy cornflakes and bread. And this is all boga. I know some of the words preach like this. You, it's, it's karmi food. You can't offer it. It's cooked by karmis. It's, your mind will become sinful if you eat this stuff. We hear sometimes it's preached. Time, place, and circumstance again. And um, if we can avoid it, Prophet himself guided us. He said, make your own. He said that with muesli. He said that with bread. He said that with seven up. He said, try to make your own. He said that with ice cream also. Try to make your own. Now, you may not be able to make your own for various reasons. And you may have other circumstances, especially if you're a family person or a working person. It's not always so easy. You know, imagine if you live in Germany and you don't have a wife and you don't have a bed machine, you don't have the time and you're a working man. What are you going to do? Die or eat bread? Germans can't live without bread. Right? <laughs> they can, but they actually find it very difficult. Right, Nitai? Yeah. Very difficult without bread. It's worse than the Bengali without rice. Fasting in Bengal means, it doesn't mean fasting like we put it. It means no rice. Simple as that. You can eat anything else. Fish, vegetables. No rice means fasting. So for Germans, many other people, rice is staple. Um, bread is staple. So what to do? You do your very, very best to try to, uh, to eat the purest thing you can. We're not here to eat. We eat. We're not. Eat. We're not. We don't live to eat. We eat to live. So we're not here just to eat and taste. Take what you need to sustain the body healthily in your service, etc. We're not so advanced. We need some sense gratification, no doubt about that. A little bit of this and that and various kinds, but minimum regulate it and not more than required. So we offer it. I know myself, when I was working before I joined the temple, I didn't have much knowledge of these things at all in those days. I just knew we should be vegetarian. I tried to avoid anything which was remotely not vegetarian. And I used to uh, go to work and I would just buy something in the canteen. I'd take something from home, but buy a little extra in the canteen, which I was convinced was vegetarian. And I would just do my best. Krishna understands it. This is not some kind of machine that we're dealing with here. You know, the machine, you know, it's like nowadays, everything, like you make a phone call to ask a question. You never get a person on the other end. You get some <laughs> machine which puts you to another machine, puts you to another machine, and then another machine which puts you back to the first machine that you started with. Start all over again, please. You press the wrong button. 
you know, and back you go again, and you never you get fed up before you reach the end, you know. Because Krishna's not like that. He's a person. He understands your sincerity. He understands your intention. He's not thinking, oh, um, yeah, let me just make sure it's vegetarian. Well, it's, I think it is. It must be uh, more or less vegetarian, a little bit, maybe 1%, 99%. No, it's good enough. Um, I like it, don't I? Yes, I like the taste of that uh, chocolate or whatever it is. Uh, mm, Sri Vishnu, Sri Vishnu, Sri Vishnu, thank you, Krishna. Yeah. Yummy, yummy. Not like that. We may or may not need it. If we don't need it, don't go there. If you have kids, sometimes you have to do things a little bit like that. But we're not here just to, you know, Sri Vishnu everything. Mm -hmm. I remember one devotee who used to, well, it's not one devotee, several devotees, um, Sankatan, they'd offer the whole supermarket. <laughs> fish, eggs, whatever was in there. If fish doesn't want, he's not going to eat it anyway. So you just take what you like, Krishna, and leave what you don't, and what you don't want. That's not the mood. We're here to develop love for Krishna. We're not here to eat. We're not here just to fill the belly. We have to do that, but that's not the goal. We want to develop the best consciousness. Now, if you need to eat bread and you're on the road, but you buy some, probably even bought sometimes on the trains in India, you would buy sometimes, or have devotees buy, you need to eat. And it's not with the intent of. I hate, hey, look at that. I like that. Go and buy it. The intention we need to eat. We need to sustain our body. And then we make whatever the best we can. We make, if Krishna doesn't want, I'll tell you an interesting point. When we were doing Sankirtan in London in the 70s, the devotees were giving out sweets on the street. Now, these sweets were very simple sweets. They were basically sugar, boiled sugar, which we would buy in bulk from some local company in London. They were cooked or boiled or whatever they did with them by some local machines in London. It was hardly an act of devotion. It was simply cooked for money and for satisfying the tongue. So we were buying these to distribute to because people like them and they would give a donation and we give them a book or something like that. So it came to Prabhupada's attention. He said, before you go out with these sweets, he didn't say these words, but this is the end result of it, you put them before Radha Gokulananda on the, in front of the altar. This idea, I don't know where it's coming from, but this was Prabhupada's words. We would put those sweets on the altar, on a table, not on the altar itself with the other offerings, in front of the deities and ask the Lord to please, you know, do what he likes. But please, we want to distribute these for the welfare of society. Please bless them, do whatever you want. This is the idea. Everything we, you know, it may not be the best of offerings, but we offer it to the Lord. Vidura was offering banana leaves to the Lord, banana skins to the Lord. Whatever we got, Krishna understands. And if we know better, we'll do better. And if for service, sometimes we have to do certain things. It, again, it's a matter of consciousness and understanding our objective goal in life. Not You can get into a billion and one details and spend your whole life on details. But the goal is to please Krishna. And according to time and circumstance, we have to use a little common sense there. So yes, if you have to take things, you try to take the purest you can, you buy it, you get the purest you can, you pray to Krishna, please purify my heart, please forgive me if there's any offense involved, whatever it is, if you be kind enough, you know, I'm so fallen, whatever it is, it's the state of consciousness. And then Krishna can... Pallad Maharaj offered poison to the Lord because his father was forcing him to eat that food. He offered it to the Lord and the food became nectar because the Lord could see the, the, the motive, not the food. Krishna's not interested in your... You know, even if you cook the best samosas on the planet... And everyone's glorifying you. I've never tasted samosas anywhere in the world like this. But if your consciousness is not good, Krishna throws them in the bin. They mean nothing. It's the consciousness. Of course, Krishna understands in the beginning our consciousness is not going to be very good either. So he accepts accordingly, reciprocates accordingly to help us to advance. It's not that extreme. 
you're not going to do absolutely like that. But still, if for whatever reason it is, but where consciousness is humble, sincere, uh, whatever, we mean the best. Krishna is very pleased. But if we're proud and we're looking down upon others, ugh, we're just offering, you know, untouchable stuff. You know, you know fallen rascal. And why does Krishna want to accept such a person's so-called offering? It's the consciousness which counts, the heart. Krishna doesn't need our food. He's looking for pretty purvakam. He's looking for love. So try to do whatever you do with as much consciousness as Krishna and humble and uh, just love for Krishna. It's like a child, you know, you give a kid, you know, a little child sees you offering it with food and the child comes in with sticks and stones and puts them before the altar and thinks it's offering the same thing. Do you think Krishna will throw the stones at the kid? What is this nonsense? Of course he's not. You know, thank you very much. He accepts that offering. He accepts it. So according to, not that we buy things rubbish and we say, Krishna, eat this because I want to eat it. Not like that either. But within a humble, conscious state of mind, yes, you can. What if you're stuck in a prison and there's nothing to eat? What are you going to do? Starve? You can do that. Or you can accept whatever you can and just pray to Krishna to please or do what you like. But I just want to offer my life to you and everything that goes along with it. Next one. We have a local question. There's about eight or nine devotees sitting here as well. And we have another one. Hari Bol Gokulani, I hope we're still there. We haven't seen Gokulani as a wonderful devotee. Yes, she's there. She lives in France and she's 80 years old. She still goes on the street on Sankata on her mm. own, on her own, just doing Prabhupada's books. Um, okay, we're going to take one local question now. Yes, Mata. So, the question is about, uh, about the quota, the Can you understand both of it as quota? What does it mean? Does it mean that the, the quota is not what we really, really need to survive? And if we take something else, it's like already too much. Yeah. <laughs> is that simple? Or, or it's like what is really coming by karma? So we have life to enjoy that. We have two Svadharmas, material spiritual, material quantum modes of nature, confusing in this age, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, the body which we receive, the mind we receive, is our quota. What that body and mind require, as we discussed a little bit, is varying according to person to person. But it's basically according to what we need to sustain our life. Um, Vedic society was organized by society, uh, divisions of society, etc. It was much clearer. In our modern society, it's more confusing. We're bombarded with consumerism bombarded with uh, marketing, social media, et cetera, et cetera. The, uh, the uh, pushings of others around us to be something which we're really not. Um, but it means to find one's position and act accordingly. Things become a lot more easier when you're materially situated. Even eating, sleeping, everything becomes a lot easier because you feel more comfortable with yourself. That is your quota. When we know what our quote is, and as I said, the imitating others, imitating others, that is when we're usurp, trying to usurp, usurp others' quotas, either by extracting wealth from them, stealing or trying to imitate them in that way, um, in various pursuits, uh, that we'll, we'll not, never be happy doing that, playing a part which is not designated to us. It's complicated. Even with the genders, men are not playing their roles. Women are not playing their roles. It's very complicated. People are confused, bewildered in this age of Kali. So the main quote in this age of Kali is chanting Hare Krishna and whatever else is possible to adapt, to adopt in one's life. 
Um, so we have that quota, materially speaking, and unfortunately, it's not always easy. It takes time, it takes help, it takes, uh, sometimes we never learn it, even this life, but we, at least we try to take the Svadharma, the spiritual one, of chanting Hare Krishna as much as we can, as much as we can. And Prabhupada made it clear for devotees, as far as eating and sleeping, you eat as much as you need to keep your health together, and you sleep as much as you need to keep your health together not more than required and try to regulate. Regulation is this is one of the secrets. When we're rightly sick, situated in life, regulation also is usually, because you may be forced by having to be at work by nine o'clock in the morning, otherwise you don't get paid and something like that, but you're not happy doing it. You should be happy in what you're doing. There should be ple inner pleasure there in what we're doing in life. Otherwise we can question what we're doing very hard Terry to find that we know but at least spiritually there should be some pleasure there in the austerities which you're performing etc one person will get pleasure in eating this one person from that one person will get pleasure from getting up in the morning early one won't we're at different levels so there has to be some pleasure there has to be some pleasure how you ascertain it again same thing you in society, one's, one's brought up in an environment according to one's nature. In our present situation, I suggest in Sangha of devotees, we discuss these things, how to find, how to regulate, how to sustain, etc., etc. It's not something which is you know, absolutely across the board uh, because there's no Varashram system in present in society and we brought up with an education system which has taught us how to be an illusion it's teaching us how to be remain in ignorance about who we are how who what, what our best role in life should be what would be good to eat what would not be good to you know all these things are normals in a human society in our modern society they're not norms they're abnorms and instead of eating the right thing, we have to take all kinds of supplements and all kinds of things to try to keep normal. People who take supplements, medicines, this means we're sick because we're not living a normal life. In normal life, there's no need for all these things because we're living a natural life, simple living, high thinking. But such a situation hardly exists. There are all kinds of other things to counter it this tablet, that tablet, this supplement, that supplement, this exercise, that exercise, all these things are due to an abnormal circumstance. So it is very hard to find one's balance. One tries one's best and one chants Hare Krishna as much as we can and render whatever service we can. But we have to have some satisfaction there, some pleasure there, whatever service it may be, but some pleasure must be there. Otherwise, how we will carry on. Without that taste, Prabhupada says, we cannot carry on with our you know, hurry, hurry bowls or whatever it is. There must be some taste there. Must be. Now, of course, we can talk more on that later. But it, it, austerity doesn't evoke love of Krishna. It's pointless. Sometimes when we go through the austerity, it's like waking up. This is a difficult one. I can see for devotees today, this waking up in the morning. Um, we, Oh, we, we did that one already. There was one other. No, that may be it. Yes. Of course, in the beginning, you may not feel love of God. You may say, well, I got up yesterday for Mongol Arti, but I didn't feel love of God. So what's the point? I may as well sleep in. <laughs> Obviously, that you may say like that. So some people do in the beginning stages. We expect instant potatoes. We expect instant prema. Um, prema is, is an interesting English word. Called, it says, the word is, Prem prematurely. Have you heard this word? Premature. Prematurely. Something too early. 
I call it prema too early, not prematurely. <laughs> prema too early. Some people want prema too early. That is premature. It's a process. So it's not like there's just, you know, a goal. There's a process of sadhana, sadhya. So knowing, and oh, Guru Shastra Sadhu gave us the structure, so there's a process, sadhana bhakti, which leads to, you know, there's different limbs, there are different leaves of sadhana bhakti. In the beginning, it's vaidhi, it's practical. And then it becomes spontaneous, and spontaneous devotional service may lead to the um, awakening of bhava and prema, etc., etc. Um, but we don't expect bhava and prema in the beginning. We don't expect even spontaneity. You may now. The, this is where spontaneity comes in, and where the actual you can say acceleration starts, and where the enthusiasm comes. Um, in many cases, now you may have incredible willpower for whatever reason from a previous lifetime or by present association has been evoked. But generally speaking, you have, it's, there's something in our lives which really spurs us on. And Prabhupada describes this in natural devotion in the sense of being spontaneous. He said, well, you know, maybe you really like to get out on Sankirtan, for instance, on Harinam. We can't wait to get out the door on Harinam or book distribution or prasad distribution or whatever it is. Or... Uh, we just came from New uh, Bergermandal Farm in Spain, and there's one devotee. What's his name? That devotee cooking? What's his name? Karuna Mai. Karuna Mai. or Karuna Mai? Mai. Karuna Mai Prabhu has cook, cooks every day, day in, day out, morning and lunch for the devotees, breakfast and lunch. And he's going, does it every, I'm sure he takes some breaks, but basically, Every day of the year, he cooks. Now, if you tell me that devotee is not getting any pleasure out of that service, I don't know. He's not getting paid for it. I don't know what he's getting. He, he, you know, he's, he's just doing it spontaneously. You don't have to ask him. He just does it. We never, I think maybe someone did ask him, but he's, he very happily prepared some tapa. We performed tapa coming from there to here in Portugal. He performed a lot. He, he made us lots of tapa for the journey. Tapa means austerity. It also means snacks in Spanish. It means nice snacks. He made samosas and so many things for our journey. Now that's the sign that a bodhi is on the path of devotional service and is rightly situated. He wants to do it. You don't have to wake him up every morning. Prabhu, oh, I don't want to do it. Get someone else. I did it last week. For God's sake, leave me alone. Which we sometimes hear. I'm getting out of here. Slam the door. And that means we're really neophyte. So in a little advance, but we actually are attracted to it. Prabhu, it's Mangalati, let's go. Japa, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Kirtan, time for class. Time to melt the cows, Jai. You don't care if it's freezing outside or boiling outside. At least the mother of the children doesn't consider, I'm not cooking for you today, it's too cold. Okay, I know you are hungry, but just make your own lunch. Make your own breakfast, son. If you want something to eat, do it yourself. It's too cold for me. No way. The mother will be up there cooking, cleaning, cold, hot, whatever it is, because she loves. If we have any gratitude, we may not have it yet, but if we have any gratitude towards the devotees of the Lord, Srila Prabhupada and other devotees who've given so much, only for our benefit, only. Prabhupada didn't have to come to this Western world. He was in Vrindavan, completely with Krishna, completely absorbed. But his life desire was to share this message. Guru Maharaj inspired it within him. But to share this message, talk about austerities, just read the Lilam Rita. If we think we're performing austerity, read Lilamrita. Remember, meditate on what Sri Prabhupada and other great devotees have done and are doing for our sake. Makes it not perhaps quite so difficult. To, maybe it does, still difficult, but at least we understand that it's not really so big an austerity that we're doing. Trying to do, you know, get up a little bit early in the morning trying to be a vegetarian, trying to chant 16 rounds, and so on and so forth. 
going out once in a blue moon on the street to chant Hare Krishna. Is it really a big austerity? Look at the karmis, I mean UK karma, look at the public. When I was in Malaysia, I couldn't believe it. I would be up in the morning, three o'clock, and then people were already on their motorbikes going to work. Three o'clock in the morning, they're getting up earlier than we are to go to work, sometimes in, the, in Malaysia, but in some countries in the freezing cold, stuck in a traffic jam for two hours if you go later. Isn't that an austerity? Working in an office all day long, isn't that an austerity? I think it's more of an austerity than getting up in the morning and uh, you know, chanting Hare Krishna, whatever we do. There's so many, but you can't avoid it. Austerity means suffering. You can't avoid it. I mean, it doesn't have to be a suffering. The prophet said the austerities are fun to you. And the austerities in devotional service become fun. They become relishable. They nourish. They nourish our real needs. They don't. They don't, they're just not they're not just reactions from our past sins. When you perform austerities in devotional service, you're not just making activities which are supposed to be favorable for your progress. You're releasing yourself from countless reactions from the past, which you're going to suffer from anyway with coronavirus or some other virus. When you perform austerities voluntarily, for whatever reason, in devotional service, you're getting freed of tons of karma from the past. Tons much more than having cancer or whatever else people have to do to get rid of their karma. Much more. So bear that in mind too, it's even materially beneficial. It has many beneficial effects, as well as regulating our senses, as well as the process of vaidhi sadhana bhakti leading to pure devotional service. It's a win-win situation. The material world is lose-lose. They may also be going through austerities and criticizing the austerity of getting up in the morning or taking a bath or whatever you do in the morning and chanting and so on and so forth. But they're going through their austerities too. Fear, anxiety, stress, frustrations, pains, anxieties, miseries of various kinds. Can't avoid it. It's karmic reaction. So by performing Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti, you clear up your karmic reactions for your when you're happy you're clearing up all your good reactions when you're struggling there a little bit you're clearing up all your bad ones so don't forget that either that's another focus you could say although it may be a temporary one it is nonetheless a focus on the path of lady okay we're going to finish there and we have a little kirtan and wish you all the very best on whatever stage we're on bhakti don't try to imitate see where we're at and do your best chant as much as we can and do the best we can and try to encourage others like you encourage your kids to grow up and not stay as babies forever Shri Prabhupada ki jai jai Prabhupada Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Rama Rama, Rama Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama
Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Don't forget also that action in the mode of goodness may taste like poison in the beginning, but turns to nectar at the end. So sometimes those austerities, when they're properly, these are not mode of goodness austerities that you're talking about here in Krishna consciousness. These are transcendental. We pay a lot of price when we want something in this world, a lot of money. We study for years sometimes to get a degree. We undergo so much suffering to achieve a goal in life. Training. We undergo, we, we, we forego so many immediate results sometimes. Materially, people do. Not to speak of spiritually. So, of course, we like to see the results. We like to see the fruits. And they will come. When the time comes, they will grow. But it does take a little while sometimes, so don't be impatient. And take shelter of those around us. Take example from those who are more advanced in spiritual life. See in the scriptures that this process is there. It's not just instant potato mash. We're not interested in potato mash instant. We want the real thing. Even when it comes to agriculture, growing things sometimes, the best nuts take a long time to mature. You can get peanuts real quick. You want macadamias, it takes quite a long time to get. Many things you could give examples like that. So it does also depend on, to limit, it depends on Krishna's mercy. It depends on our desire. If you really want something, we will make the effort to go through the necessary process to achieve it. But not that we should be lazy either, although it may vary from each and every one of us. We shouldn't be lazy or, you know, imitative especially, or go down unnecessarily to a lower level. We should be trying to move forward in our spiritual lives, not going backwards. Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai, Gaur Prima, Hare Krishna. We'll see you all soon. Hari Bol from Govardhan, from Lisbon, from wherever you are in France, India, England, Australia, New Zealand, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, Slovakia, Germany, Hungary, Holland, Ireland, wherever you are, in the world, Fiji, wherever it is, Northern Ireland also, and Slovakia, and Czech, and wherever it is. Uh, wherever you are, we'd like to thank you for being with us today, and Hare Krishna, all the best on your journeys. Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai, Hari Nam Sankirtan Ki Jai, Gora Prem and Andi. Thank you, Maharaj. Hari Bo. Thank you. Hari Krishna Maharaj. Hari Krishna.